Oh, and welcome. Thanks very much, Simon, for the extra time. Um, which we might need, we might not. Um, but you can keep me. You can keep me. Um, you can keep me to time if I overrun at all. Um, so yeah, first of all, thank you very much for um, for inviting me to come and speak uh, to your conference. And uh, it was great to hear the service users um, at the beginning because I think that that is probably the most important. Um, or these are the most important people that as practitioners we can listen to. Um, so hello from a rather uh, drich and drizzly um, Glasgow. Um, I got Drukit coming in this morning, so uh, that will be it for the Scottish words, hopefully, um, as we go forward. But um, yeah, it's pretty wet and yucky up here, but then that's just the way it's supposed to be. Um, hopefully the weather's a little bit better where you are. Um, in terms of introductions, who am I? So I am an autistic um, man, first of all. Um, I'm father to an autistic daughter and also another one who has Down syndrome. So we are a pretty neurodivergent family. Uh, I'm a researcher and I'll kind of cover briefly what my research uh, entails or what it's about shortly. I've, I'm an alternative child and adolescent psychiatrist um, or a critical child and adolescent psychiatrist. And perhaps I'm certainly the only one that I know who is openly autistic. You may be able to correct me on that. You might be able to um, introduce me to other. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for other autistic child and adolescent psychiatrists, but um, thus far, I'm afraid my search has been futile. Um, I'm a cyclist, I'm a photographer, I'm a bird lover and indulge in many other special interests, which I'll try not to bore you with. Um, Simon, you did make a potential error, which was asking the autistic guy or telling the autistic guy you've got more time. Um, so that's why I say just keep a track on, just keep a track on me that I'm not overrunning. So this is the quick version or, or the, the short diagram of the research that I engage in. Um, and the key research question that all of my projects are about is how can we improve outcomes for neurodivergent children? Um, by improving outcomes, to do so, we have to improve, um, we have to improve environments, we have to improve um, the, the, the life chances, if you like, for um, neurodivergent children. Um, and that's important. We'll kind of come to that later on. Um, but I think uh, initially your nurse um, lead or your nurse manager at the beginning talked about um, a group of people who are, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, discriminated against or are very much in the minority. And uh, I don't think we can find uh, a group which is more discriminated against than neurodivergent children and young people. Um, I'm happy to take challenges on that. I don't think it's a competition, but um, I think that as things go and as things stand, um, this is a group which is very unrecognised and, and highly discriminated against. So from that point of view, my research leads me into education and working with education colleagues to see what we can do about school. Children spend about a third of their waking hours in school, so there's certainly an area there that we need to think about and look at. I'm also interested in children's health and how we do um, neurodivergence within the NHS um, for children. And that covers child and adolescent services and also paediatric services. Um, how can we make our assessments better? How can we make our assessments less stressful? Um, how can we make our outcomes more appropriate and more useful? Um, think about social work because we know that much uh, there's a much higher rate of abuse and neglect within the neurodivergent childhood population than there is within the neurotypical population. If you're neurodivergent, you're at a significantly higher risk of experiencing abuse and neglect. Um, and so we need to think about how we work with our social work colleagues and how they understand neurodivergence. Um, and then finally, primary care. Um, so health visitors and general practitioners. Um, how do they deal with families um, who are neurodivergent? So that's kind of the, the main areas of, of research that I'm into at the moment. Um, along with that, obviously, I have an interest in equality. Um, and so I, I spend a fair amount of time thinking about equality um, and how we can improve that for, uh, for neurodivergent children and young people. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to start off with a question. Um, and I appreciate that this is not a back and forth forum, which makes this slightly more difficult. but. I want you to have a think about why is being neurodivergent still stigmatised in 2023? 
Um, I've not said is being neurodivergent still stigmatised in 2023 because I think the answer to that is relatively obvious um, and I'm happy to take discussion about that later on. But my question is why? Um, and I'm going to try and aim to answer some of that through this uh, through this presentation. Why is this important? Um, I talked briefly there about the uh, discrimination that, that um, people <clears throat> who are neurodivergent experience. And these are the kind of questions that I ask myself, uh, and I hope therefore others therefore may, may continue to ask. And these are things that you could possibly think about in your service, as Simon said, how do we deal with this? Because this is unacceptable. Um, why are only 20% of autistic people in employment? What's the reason for that? Um, there cannot be, a, there's no particular reason that I can find <clears throat> that says that only 20% of autistic people um, are able to function um, in employment. I just don't think that's true. I suspect that more likely what's happening here is that autistic people are excluded from employment by a number of reasons. Number one is their interaction and engagement of school and getting an education, being able to attend. Um, and then number two is the social demands that are placed upon people in employment and, uh, and the lack of appropriate reasonable adjustments. Why are up to 80% of the children and young people in prison meet the criteria? Why do up to 80% of children and young people in prison meet criteria for ADHD? And that's a gross over representation. Why is it so high? Um, why are at least 60% of children and young people within CAM services neurodivergent? And I say at least 60% because I'm not aware of any proper national census ever having been conducted on this. Um, I use 60% because it was an estimate from uh, my own service that I worked in um, in NHS Lanarkshire. Um, I was speaking to colleagues in Grampian uh, last week and they thought it was more likely to be around 80%. So around Anything between um, 60 and 80 percent of children and young people in ch child and adolescent mental health services generically are also neurodivergent. Why are they so overrepresented? Um, why is autism, ADHD, dyspraxia, whatever you want to think about, any kind of neurodevelopmental um, neurotype, why is it associated with significantly higher levels of mental illness and distress? I'm going to give you some answers to that or reasons that I think that might be the case. Um, and why are so many emotionally based school refusers neurodivergent? Um, and again, we've kind of talked briefly about the importance of education and how that might not fit for neurodivergent uh, children and young people. And so one of the things that we're engaged in finding out is how do we change that? Because um, presumably nobody gets up in the morning wanting to make life difficult um, for these kids. But in order for us to do that, in order for us to look into other services, in order for us to gain to, to attain these goals, um, we need to put our own house in order. Um, now, I'm not quite sure why this guy looks so proud of his work here, because I'm not sure he's done the best job um, looking at the back of it. But I thought this picture did represent a little bit like what CAM services feel like, um, and I'm not sure if that's the case down your way, um, but certainly at the moment up in Scotland, I think this is a reasonable picture um, that tells a story of what CAMS looks like at the moment. Um, <clears throat> So we need to think about that and we need to put our own house in order first. Um, and perhaps that does mean thinking about our autistic staff first, because um, if we get it right for them, then we've got much better chance of getting it right for our patients. So I was asked to talk a little bit about my experience um, <clears throat> and what it's like to be an autistic child and adolescent psychiatrist. Interestingly, within the Autistic Doctors Network, um, the faces that are blanked out um, in other words, there are people still within the autistic doctors network who feel that they cannot make their, um, who feel that they cannot come out. <clears throat> um, these are people within the autistic doctors network who are on their leadership group. Um, and if you look at their website, you will find a number of blanked out faces. So people who are not willing to, or not able, or don't feel able to say um, to the world that they're autistic. Um, and that kind of chimes with my own experience. So when I was um, when I was training as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, here are some of the quotes um, which which I heard um, or which were said to me. So in various ways, um, I was told, "Don't tell anyone you're autistic." 
um, you'll never get a job, you won't get employed. Um, just keep it to yourself. If you want to be autistic, that's fine, but don't tell anybody else. That strikes me as outrageous from a specialty where we are supposedly concerned about stigma. Um, so we paint within psychiatry um, pictures within uh, Royal College, for example, about tackling stigma. But actually, stigma is inherent, I would argue, within our specialty. Um, and it's outrageous that we stigmatise mental illness. It's outrageous that we stigmatise um, alternative neurotypes. But there we go, that's my personal experience. Um, another thing that I've heard, but you can't be autistic because you can mentalise. So my training is in mentalisation, my background in mentalisation based um, therapy. It's something which I find personally very useful as an autistic person working in psychiatry. Um, but apparently I couldn't be autistic because I can mentalise. Well, you've got theory of mind. Um, and this comes on to this idea that neurotypicals own theory of mind, which of course I think we can dispel that that's not true. Um, and that again is from a, a, a senior um, practitioner, a, a child and adolescent psychiatrist <clears throat> who was my supervisor, um, who is dealing with children who are autistic on a daily basis um, and holds a view that says, Autistic people can't mentalise. Autistic people don't have theory of mind. Very black and white. It's ironic, isn't it, that us autistics are accused of being black and white, um, <clears throat> when actually that is one of the things that I see most commonly as a thinking trap amongst uh, my neurotypical colleagues. Um, so you can't be autistic because you can mentalise. There's another one I didn't put in there, which was a, a discussion I had about going on call and I was saying I'm not going to go on call because it's it's not it doesn't fit my neurotype at all. I don't like the unexpected. I like to know what's happening. I can't just man a phone. I did it for three years as a well, six years as a trainee. I'd had enough as a consultant. I wasn't going to do it anymore. Um, and the response to that was, but I think you can. OK, so the outcome of that is either one, you think I'm at it. Um, in other words, I'm making this up, I'm work shy, I'm doing something to get out of doing additional work. Um, or number two is that you think you know my mental state better than I do. <clears throat> and my question to the audience would be in that engagement and in that conversation, who had the lack of mentalisation? Who had the lack of theory of mind? Um, the other thing I would say is that everybody's generally at least to your face, all gangster, um, pardon the phrase, um, about you being autistic until you do something autistic. Um, and so even recently, um, even within, you know, recent employment, um, I have heard phrases like, I think you were very, um, I think you were very um, inflexible in that meeting, Jason. And that makes me, well, yes, and you employed me as an autistic man. Um, so I am autistic. It's part of my neurotype to be relatively inflexible. I think generally speaking, I'm aware of that, <clears throat> um, but it will from time to time emerge. It's not something that I'm going to change. Um, and if you don't like it, sack me, is my response now. But then that, that's because I'm big enough and old enough to say that, and I feel like I have agency to say that. Um, but yeah, there's still certainly something within that. that everybody is very, um, politically correct about autism often now. Um, however, when you do something autistic, um, oh dear. And I presume that it's like that for ADHD as well. I have a little bit of ADHD traits. I wouldn't say that I would meet the diagnostic criteria for ADHD. Um, but I, I know colleagues who do have ADHD and who have encountered very similar um, difficulties in the context of their work and some who have ADHD who will not tell anybody in case it causes them problems. So we're still hiding in the closet um, and that to me, particularly within a mental health specialty, is outrageous um, and something that I think we really need to think about within our own, um, within our own teams. <clears throat> so I would argue that the goal that we should be trying to achieve is healthy neurodivergence. Um, so we should be able to think about people um, who are neurodivergent and expect that they will have the same health, the same mental health, the same physical health opportunities um, 
the same life opportunities as anybody else within our society. Um, we should not be thinking about um, people who are neurodivergent as being in any way broken, disordered, um, unfixable, whatever kind of label it is that, that gets attached. Um, and I've stuck up here some photographs of um, relatively well known neurodivergent individuals. Um, so there's a danger in doing this, I appreciate, which is to say, oh, if you're not one of those famous people that's changing the world, um, with your superpowers, then you don't count. That's not really the purpose of doing this. The purpose of doing, of putting up these pictures is to say there is a way in which individuals can be fulfilled and be neurodivergent. So we have Will I Am up there who is ADHD. Um, <clears throat> I've put Luna Lovegood in. I know she's a fictional character, um, but I love her presentation, the actress's um, presentation of an artistic ADHD girl within the Harry Potter films. Um, and I think when I would fit the criteria for both. Um, we've got Anthony Hopkins there, um, doesn't, wasn't diagnosed till his 80s. Um, funny the way he's got a life as an actor and he's autistic. Um, <clears throat> and I thought we couldn't do imaginative play. It's odd that, isn't it? Um, we've got Chris Packham, um, who's pretty well known, I think, in terms of being out of the closet with his autism now. And on the left, Elon Musk, um, who, love him or hate him, um, is nonetheless a pretty successful autistic um, guy. And part of the reason that he is successful is because he is autistic, I would argue. So the question that we might have then is how do we get there? How do we get into this area where we can look for healthy neurodivergence rather than pathologizing? Um, and one way through that is thinking about the neurodiversity paradigm. Um, so for those of you as yet unfamiliar with the neurodiversity paradigm, um, this was an idea that stemmed um, back in 1998, <clears throat> following discussions with Judy Singer, who is on the right hand side there, um, and Harvey Bloom, who was a journalist. Um, and this idea of neurodiversity um, came around at that time. Neurodiversity is not pathologizing. Um, it's a social model of disability. So in other words, the disability is not sitting within the individual. Any attached disability to neurodivergence sits within the environment. Um, it's like biodiversity. It's understanding your the niche and the environment as a whole. It refers to the whole population. It doesn't refer to individuals. Um, <clears throat> and I guess originally this was based around thinking about autism, but later was applied to other neurotypes. Um, and the way that we can think about neurodiversity is the idea that across a population, there are a number of traits. Um, now, some of those we classify as, as neurodivergent. Um, some of them we perhaps don't. Everybody's neurotype is unique, uh, as the, the speakers were saying earlier. <clears throat> so everybody has a unique neurotype, um, although some of us will fit more around the cluster around the mean uh, and some of us will sit out towards the edges of that um, kind of normal distribution curve. Um, and for those of us who sit out towards the edges, who have relatively rare neurotypes, we might consider ourselves neurodivergent um, within this scheme. Um, I need to be careful because I think Judy Singer has um, more recently been cancelled. My slides aren't moving on, which is a bit of a problem. So I have to be careful because she's made some comments and history has been rewritten. But I think it's fair to say that neurodiversity did stem from, from Judy Singer, whatever you think of her now. Um, <clears throat> so as I say, this concept relates to the whole population. It doesn't provide judgment. It's not saying that neurodivergence is a good thing. Um, but it's not saying it's a bad thing either. It's just saying that it is what it is. Um, as I said, problems are not located within the individual within this paradigm. Um, and individuals who, uh, and this is often a language issue um, that we sometimes talk about, you sometimes hear people referring to individuals as being neurodiverse. Um, that, that's, that's a juxtaposition. So the population is neurodiverse, an individual is neurotypical, neurodivergent. Um, so those kind of words refer to the individuals within the population. The whole population is neurodiverse. Um, but I guess this is 
also quite opposed to the psychomedical model of deficit, um, which many of us will have been brought up in and steeped. Just thinking about social model uh, or the social disability model, um, <clears throat> really this is modelled after the civil rights movements. Um, and uh, Professor Mike Oliver here, who's a, a disabled academic, coined this term originally way back in 1983. So this is a social model of disability came first. Um, what it states essentially is that disability is something which society creates. So disability is the exclusion of, um, of individuals from societal activities where they're not able to engage because the activity is not opened um, or does not enable their engagement, if that makes sense. Um, so it's not something that happens inside your body or mind that does not intrinsically disable you. And I would argue that there is nothing in, for example, the autism criteria, which we'll have a look at later on, which is in fact intrinsically disabling. Um, and the same would be the case throughout um, all neurodivergencies. Um, the only exception perhaps is the significant impulsivity associated with ADHD, um, which I think obviously can at times present a risk to self and others. Um, and that's something which you know which we need to think about. Um, but broadly speaking, across the across the board, I don't see anything which is intrinsically disabling about a neurodivergence. Um, in fact, it's just that society makes it difficult or impossible for us neurodivergents to access um, all activities. And I guess that's coming back into what was said by your service users earlier. Um, so they were asking for reasonable adjustments because accessing a service based on, designed essentially by neurotypicals and based on the neurotypical norm does not, um, does not allow easy access by those of us who are neurodivergent. Which leads me on to think about flowers. So here's one of my um, special interests. I can't help myself. They have to come in somewhere along the line. So here's one of mine um, in terms of gardening and, and flora and fauna. Um, <clears throat> at the top there is Alpine Blue South Thistle. It's probably the rarest plant within the UK. So it's a relatively extreme example. Um, it grows on six ledges um, within the Cairngorms, uh, undisclosed locations, um, because it, it's so rare. It requires to be protected um, and versus that against the common dandelion, which I'm sure you do have down in, in, in Oxford and Buckingham. Um, we've got plenty of them up here for sure. Um, now, the difference when you think about the biodiversity here, the difference is that the Alpine Blue South Thistle is very specific in the environment in which it can grow. If you transplant an Alpine Blue South Thistle down here to Glasgow, <clears throat> and try to plant it next to a dandelion, it will die. It will not survive because it requires the environment which it gets within the, the, the Cairngorms, within that area. Contrast that with the, the common dandelion, it can do anything it wants. It can grow anywhere. It literally doesn't even need soil. It grows out of paving slabs. It grows through concrete. They have no issues whatsoever in spreading. They produce lots of seeds. They you know, happily germinate anywhere at all, next to anywhere at all. Um, <coughs> So the common dandelion is, is a very specific, sorry, is, is a very generic generalist, if you like. The south thistle, not so much. But here's the thing, they both have specific purposes within the environment. And if you were to remove them all, then we would have problems. So common dandelions, you might be aware, are the early food for bees um, and early hatching butterflies in the beginning of spring, where very little else is flowering. So dandelions are incredibly important to the initial um, hatching of bees um, to, to run into the summer. And we know that bees are very important because they essentially are the, the giver of our food in terms of pollination. So without bees, we all die. <clears throat> um, and without dandelions, the bees don't survive. So dandelions are incredibly important. Um, so is the south thistle. If you take it out of the Cairngorms, there are several types of butterfly which require the south thistle um, to, to exist. The south thistle disappears then so do other fauna, um, so does do, do other issues, <coughs> pardon me, other issues emerge. You can see that throughout biodiversity. If you remove one, like for example, within Scotland, we've got lots of deer here. 
Um, the reason we've got lots of deer is because way back in the day, somebody removed the wolves. So there was a previous balance within the, the biosphere. Now there's not a balance and so things overgrow. That leads to problems with um, trees and biodiversity within forests, which leads to problems within so on and so on. So basically, <clears throat> within the biodiversity, everything has its place. It's all important. Um, <clears throat> What we don't do within biodiversity is try to make the south thistle more like a dandelion. And I would argue that at least in the past, if not in the present, and I think probably still within the present, this is what we do to neurodivergent people. We try to make the rare common. We exclude the rare and we tell the rare that it's disordered and we introduce therapies or approaches which try to make autistic people or ADHD people more neurotypical. Now you can ask why we do that. Um, there is a debate to be had as to whether that's appropriate or not. I personally don't think it is. Um, in actual fact, what we do within the biodiversity framework is that we treat the rare <coughs> with greater respect and care. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so the South Thistle is an undisclosed location, so it's where it grows. It's protected um, within the Cairn Gorms. It's counted frequently. It has, you know, netting over its over where it grows so that people can't come up and pick it or wreck it if they do find it. Um, so we treat those rare species, which are still important within their nation, within the population. Um, we treat them with greater care and respect. Um, we don't treat dandelions with a huge amount of care and respect. Um, and perhaps we should. Um, but the, the, the point here is that what we don't try to do is to change this disordered south thistle into being more like a dandelion. It survives in its very specific niche. It provides a very specific purpose for the overall biosphere, the overall population, and in exactly the same way, neurodivergent people, ADHD, autism, dyspraxia, whatever it is that you want to add, <coughs> dyslexia, um, any of these so-called, uh, any of these neurotypes, and I was going to say so-called conditions, which is not a term I agree with, any of those neurotypes add to the population. And if we flip back to think about the picture of the people um, that we had before, we have Elon Musk, who uh, has his autism allowed him to think that actually rockets could land as well as take off. Not something that in the history of rocket science, um, as Simon referred to earlier, had ever been thought by anybody else. <clears throat> I just want to have a little word before I move on um, from this idea of neurodiversity on neurodiversity light, as it's becoming called. Um, so there's a danger here, um, which is that people who are not particularly inclusive have latched on to the neurodiversity language and the neurodiversity paradigm um, to discuss or to, 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 you know, around the research or perhaps around um, their practice. So they use pseudo neurodiversity language and they very often do it badly so it's a bit like dad dancing um, as I sometimes say um, or this idea of getting down with the kids something which every child and adolescent um, psychiatry trainee is warned at the beginning don't do don't try to get down with the kids and use their language it just makes you look ridiculous you have to accept who you are um, but there is a, a there is a definite danger around this, um, and one example of that, for example, uh, might be the the increase in people referring to autism spectrum condition as if that is a non pathologizing alternative. So that's a, one example. Um, autism spectrum condition is not non pathologizing. Um, so, and a way that we can check that out is to say, do we talk about people's homosexual condition? I imagine we don't. If we do, we shouldn't. But we do talk about anti Agnes's skin condition. So condition is inherently pathologizing in our language, I would argue. Um, again, happy to take debate in the comments later on. Um, but actually anything which is, and I'll come to this later on in terms of um, paradigms that we can think about using, anything which is uh, pathologizing in that way, anything which others neurodivergent people is, is just not acceptable to the neurodivergent community. OK, speaking about othering the neurodivergent community, let's take autism as an example. 
I'm only using this as an, ex as an example rather than ADHD because I can pretty much fit the autism criteria in one page. The ADHD criteria runs on forever. Um, so let's use autism as an example, but let's think that we can happily um, <clears throat> do exactly the same here with ADHD. So as an autistic person, looking through this, here's what the DSM-5, here's what my colleagues think of me. <clears throat> Persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction. OK, who's the judge? Deficits in social emotional reciprocity. Um, deficits in non-verbal communicative behaviours used for social interaction. Um, Notice that the importance of social interaction here, um, which is a pretty neurotypical value, is, is um, somewhat overrated, perhaps. Um, oh, poorly integrated verbal and non-verbal communication, abnormalities in eye contact. Can anybody tell me what normal eye contact is? Is there a definition somewhere which states how much eye contact one person is supposed to have um, and we'll often find that, I think, in, in psychiatrists' um, mental state examinations, eye contact normal. What does that actually mean? Um, deficits in understanding and use of gestures. OK, are gestures important? Um, total lack of facial expressions. I would say that some people make a very good living out of that. You can think about Jack D or um, very <clears throat> and other comedians who do a pretty good job of using total lack of facial expressions in their in their um, comedy. It's in developing and maintaining an understanding relationships. Well, it's funny because we just discovered a couple of autistic ladies who were married with children. Um, difficulties adjusting behaviour to suit various social contexts. Difficulties in sharing imaginative play. Um, what's acting if it's not imaginative play? Um, pardon me, I just moved the slide on by mistake. <clears throat> Absence of interest in peers. Well, that assumes that your peers are interesting, I suppose. Um, restricted repetitive patterns of behaviour. Um, OK, manifested by at least two of the following. So here we go. Stereotyped or repetitive motor movements. OK, so. Um, A minute ago, we didn't have enough motor movements, but now we've got too many. Um, insistence and sameness, inflexible adherence to routines, ritualized patterns of verbal and non-verbal behavior. OK, um, highly restricted, fixated interest. So even my hobbies now are, are pathologized. So highly restricted, fixated interests that are abnormal in intensity oh, or focus, right? Again, is there a definition of what is a normal intensity or focus to have around an interest? There will be many people in this room who have very intensive interests who are not autistic. Um, do you consider it to be abnormal? Would someone else consider it to be abnormal? Is there a scale somewhere that we can measure the level of intensity or focus of an interest? Um, and hypo or hypo, hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input. So if I have particularly acute hearing and I have particularly acute vision and I'm aware of things beyond the usual sensory range of neurotypical people, that's a pathology. Interesting. Um, excessive smelling or touching of objects. Um, one might wonder here where what is non-excessive? How much smelling are we allowed before we become disordered? Um, so that's my critique. And as a person with autism, I look at that and I think to myself, how dare you? How dare you assassinate my character, my personality, the way that I have been, you know, born, created, made, um, whatever, you know, whatever kind of um, slant you want to take on, on these things. How dare you say that all, everything, just about everything about me is a deficit? Compared to who, compared to what, why do we have to do these things that we have to do supposedly in terms of social interaction? Who, you know, who died and made them the judge, as the old saying goes. 
So the question has been covered um, previously by um, Carol Gray and Tony Atwood, um, who just reframed the old um, DSM-4 criteria for Asperger's. Um, <clears throat> and I pretty much, I like this, I think this is a bit better. Um, so here we go, we're talking about discovery now, not diagnosis. Um, and we're talking about a qualitative advantage in social interaction manifested by a majority of the following. So here we go, peer relationships characterised by absolute loyalty. Well, I don't see that in DSM-5, but it's certainly true of many autistic people. Impeccable dependability. Yes, if you tell me to be somewhere at a certain time, my rigidity and my need for things to be just so will make sure that that happens. Um, free of sexist, ageist, culturalist bias. Yep, I just see people as they are. I don't really add all those societal assumptions. It doesn't happen in my brain automatically. It's just kind of the way that I function. Um, speak in one's mind irrespective of social context. My goodness me, that will get you into trouble. Um, but nonetheless, it's a very helpful um, tool for getting things forward. Elon Musk's rockets are a good example of that. Um, the social context is that rockets go up, not down. Elon Musk doesn't subscribe to social context, so he simply says, well, let's just work out how to land the rocket. Um, ability to pursue personal theory and perspectives despite conflicting evidence. Yeah, great. Um, listening without continual judgment or assumption. We mentioned previously that neurotypicals don't, in fact, own theory of mind. Um, and if you flip it around, we uh, as autists, for example, are very good at uh, autistic theory of mind. Um, we're also very good at autistic communication, um, I should say. And on it goes, I'm not going to go through each and every one of these, um, but you get the idea. Um, what I do quite like down here is cognitive skills characterised by at least four of the following, strong preference for detail. Well, that's a helpful thing, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> I would hazard a guess that you might find that quite a number of people in our police service are autistic. Um, original, unique perspectives in problem solving. Yeah, because we're not constrained by the social way of doing things. Um, avid perseverance in gathering and cataloguing information on a topic of interest. Yep, absolutely. Um, persistence of thought. In other words, we don't get derailed by what everybody else says. Um, encyclopedic or digital knowledge of one or more topics. That's a much nicer way of saying fixed, whatever it is, blah, blah, interest. Um, and yeah, I can tell you an awful lot about things about my particular topics. Um, and I think that's helpful in my career. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a similar reframing for um, ADHD as yet. But that could lead us to wonder, is diagnosis even important at all? Well, when we think about the word diagnosis, and let's break it down, what it means is way to knowledge. So identity is important. Um, Tony Atwood and Carol Gray there talked about um, discovering, um, and identity is important. So a diagnosis broken down into what it really means, which is understanding somebody as a route to knowledge about them, is important. Um, insight, understanding, acceptance. These are the things that perhaps lead to healthy neurodivergence. Um, and that understanding and insight is not necessarily just located in the neurodivergent person. That understanding and insight needs to be located within the wider context of society and its machinations as well. So, um, this is a picture of Christopher Gilberg. Uh, he's a professor in um, child and adolescent psychiatry in Gothenburg and Glasgow and various other places. Um, and actually one of my mentors, um, secretly one of my heroes. Um, and one of the biggest things that, that Chris has ever done in his life is come up with this concept of essence, which he very conveniently and in a very non-autistic fashion named early symptomatic syndromes eliciting clinical neurodevelopmental examination. And I think perhaps only Chris and I in the whole of the world are people who can just run that, run that off their tongue um, after significant amounts of practice. But what this basically says is that neurotypes overlap and it's not the exception. In fact, it's the rule. It is rare to find, if not rare, it's you never find somebody with just pure autism, at least not presenting to services. There's always an overlap of other neurotypes. 
What happens if you're doing a, an old style assessment of somebody um, for autism and you only tick three boxes and you need the fourth and you don't tick it? What happens then? Are they autistic or are they not autistic? Why is the cut off set where it is? Um, what does that actually mean? And the importance here of understanding the child is, is what's really central to this. So it's about gaining a holistic formulation and a child centred approach. So we understand the child's neurotypes, regardless of diagnosis. Diagnosis is secondary, it's useful. We can put labels on people if they want it, if that's helpful. But what's really important is the overlap, understanding the actual individual. So what overlap? Well, we know that what we might think of as childhood neurodevelopmental um, neurotypes overlap. So those kind of neurotypes that begin in childhood um, frequently overlap and they can come in any flavour, shape or size. And this is one of the things which makes neurodivergent people individual. So this is also one of the reasons that your earlier speaker um, said just saying somebody's autistic is not helpful. Um, so you can't just say that they're autistic you, because it doesn't tell you anything about that individual. Um, every autistic person is different. And one of the reasons that every autistic person is different is because they're all intermixed um, <clears throat> with lots of different types of neurotype. As is the same across the population, there's no one person who doesn't have any. Um, I, I would challenge anybody in this room or listening to this lecture as to whether you had absolutely no traits of autism or ADHD or dyslexia or, you know, whatever. I think it's likely that almost everybody, if not everybody within this room, can identify at least one autistic or ADHD trait in their personality. That doesn't mean that you're autistic or, AD or have ADHD, for example. Um, that only means that these traits are widespread throughout the population and it's a cluster that counts. So why is it important? <clears throat> because understand, um, if you understand your make and model, then you know exactly what you can and can't do with it. So why does knowing matter? Because if I want to take my 1920s Bugatti up that Land Rover track, I'm going to come to a sticky end pretty quickly. If I want to race my Land Rover on a race track, it's not going to do particularly well. And one of the things that I often talk about with children and families um, is this idea of understanding what's going on for you. And sometimes that comes as a bit of a eureka moment, because if you've spent your life trying to compare yourself to neurotypical people and wondering why you can't do the things that they seem to be able to do by magic, it's possibly because your neurodivergence means that those particular connections in your brain don't connect. That's not to say you're useless. That's not to say that you're disordered. That's not to say there's something wrong with you. What that is to say is that you have a unique set of characteristics and you just have to find out what they are. Now, I said before that I'm a keen cyclist. Um, I'd like to pretend sometimes that I'm, I don't know if there's other cyclists in the room, but I'd like to pretend sometimes that I'm like Taddy Pogaccia or, um, or, you know, name of our, you know, top class Tour de France winning um, professional uh, cyclists. I'm not, I never would be. I could train all the day long. It won't make any difference. I'm not going to be that guy because they are literally one in a million. There's very, very few people who have just the right makeup in terms of temperament and physical characteristics and right down to how their mitochondria process energy that make them who they are. Um, I can train all I like. Um, what I actually have to do really is to enjoy cycling and then stand back and watch them. <clears throat> we were lucky enough to host the, the World Championships and in, in Glasgow recently and for cycling. And the amount of athleticism is just outrageous when you see it in, in real life. It's outrageous. Um, and we just have to stand back and clap because we can't all be the same. I'm not Taddy Pogacar and I never will be. I just have to accept that. I have to accept who I am. If I was Taddy Pogacar, it's important that I know that I'm a guy who's one in a million who can sprint and climb and, you know, move bikes at incredible speeds for incredible periods of time and, you know, without 
um, without coming unstuck. Um, that's about knowing who we are and that's about tailoring our gifts um, to what we do best. Um, and in this context here, I, I once had a con, I guess it's worth sharing this, I once had a discussion with a, a parent who was very concerned that his child couldn't do maths and he was telling me that he'd spent thousands of pounds on a, a, a tutor um, to help his child do maths. And I, we got the conversation, well, what does he like doing? Because um, I'm kind of mentalization, stroke solution focused um, therapeutic background. So I said, what, what does he like doing? Oh, if you give him a chance, he would just sit and draw all day long. I said, well, let's bring in to his session some of his drawings, let's have a look. These drawings were absolutely amazing. This guy was an artist um, without any training whatsoever, but he wasn't a mathematician. And so the question that I asked dad was, how much money have you spent on an art tutor? Of course, the answer was nothing. And I'm concerned or was concerned that actually what we were trying to do here was make a south of so a dandelion. But if we understand our niche, our, our gifts, our, the, the things that we have that we can bring to the table, that we can bring to the population as a whole, because we're not all the same, we can't all be the same, then I don't see that there's any harm in that. I sometimes think that being neurodivergent is like running a race with other people um, while you're wearing a backpack and hiking boots and they're all in gym shorts and, and trainers and you're wondering why you can't keep up with them. Well, it's pretty straightforward. It's very difficult to keep up with people in their own environment. But when those same people with their gym shorts and trainers are taken out to hills, as you see on the right hand side there, um, they're not going to do that well, but the guy with the backpack and the hiking boots and the walking poles, that's where they're going to excel. So just as we finish up, here's some of my thoughts, at least on what might help. The first one is we need to be neuroaffirmative. Um, we need to be thinking about ourselves um, and our practice. And we need to be asking a question. Is it helpful to tell children and parents that their child or, or they are disordered? Particularly when some, this is something which is lifelong, is an intrinsic part of the persona, and more importantly, cannot be cured. Should not be cured, you might argue. Um, is the disorder label appropriate in this day and age? If I take you back a little bit and you remember into the, in fact, I think into the early 80s, you would still have found DSM criteria within the sexual deviant sections, which would have pathologized homosexuality. Now we think about that and we cringe. Is that what we'll think in another 20 years about neurodivergence? What might help? Mind your language. I mentioned before that we would come across and think about language um, and think about some tenants for language. And here's ones that, that, that Nate, uh, the National Autism Implementation Team within Scotland have, have kind of come up with um, in consultation. Why am I using the terms that I use as a practitioner? Are they appropriate by the neurodivergent community? So I'll give you a quick step for a hint now. Autism spectrum disorder is not appropriate. Um, I'd love to find a version of ADHD which was less pathologizing. Um, if anybody has it, you can stick it in the comments. Um, would I use this language if I was speaking to a neurodivergent person? So whatever language you're writing in the notes, would you would you say that to them? I'm, on, I'm only using these words because it's a legacy in my profession. Autism spectrum disorder, um, you know, eye contact limited. Whatever it might be that you're, you know, that you might use. Does the language that I use challenge or does it reinforce negative stereotypes or stigma? Does it other neurodivergent people? Does it make neurodivergent people less worthy or less accepted and if it does then we need to think about a change. Healthy neurodivergence I think. Neurodivergence does not need to equal anxiety or any other mental illness. Practitioners uh, cannot, uh, if I had a pound for every time I've had a referral refused from CAMS because the person, because the referral was for anxiety and the response was well they're autistic so that's to be expected. No it's not. It's not within the DSM-5. You won't find it anywhere that autistic people are expected to be anxious. 
um, we're not expected to have other mental illnesses either. It doesn't come as part of the territory. We've maybe allowed that to become part of the discussion within mental health services, but it's not intrinsically true, particularly if we go back to our own manuals, which tell us that or we can flip back to that dreadful DSM-5 assassination of autism, but you won't find anxiety in there. Um, psychological therapies can and should be modified if that's preferred um, to improve accessibility. And it's not difficult. We're not asking people to change the world. Um, what we're asking people to do is to mentalise, um, to use that theory of mind to think, what's it like to be autistic? How might I be able to help? And to work and listen to your clients, to listen to your children, to listen to people who are telling you what is difficult for them and to think with them about how we might change the environment to allow them to engage. Um, diagnosis and goodbye is not sufficient. <clears throat> so I'm not sure what you're doing down there, but certainly still up here, there are services who will simply say, you have autism spectrum disorder, here's a leaflet, bye bye. It's not acceptable because we need to have a proper formulation and an understanding of neurotype. That's the only thing that will be useful. Labeling somebody with, di with a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder tells us nothing. In the same way that labeling somebody with ADHD tells us nothing. It doesn't tell them what they can do to improve their chances of access in society, and it doesn't tell them what society needs to do to improve their accesses. Um, so psychoeducation is vital, and that needs to be to the system, not just to the individual. Um, and I think it's also very useful to help people understand using metaphor, and, and supposedly autistic people can't use metaphor, but actually that's just nonsense. Most autistic people are very comfortable with metaphor when they know that a metaphor has been used. Um, and the social battery model or the cookie jar model are, are very useful ones, which you can, you know, you can Google and, and you may well already use. Um, but thinking about what depletes your battery and then what might recharge your battery is really important. Fifth, environment first. Um, so we don't try to modify the child, we try to modify the environment as much as possible. Um, and as I said, the vast majority of disabilities are located in the environment. Simple modifications help. Um, masking and camouflage, and surprisingly, isn't one of them. But the reason that autistic people mask in camouflage is to hide from stigma. So if we need to ask the question as to whether stigma still exists, the question is, does masking still exist? And if so, then one answers the other. Um, finally, challenge myths and remain curious. Um, so we do do eye contact, or we might. Um, we certainly have empathy, um, which is one of the worst, most outrageous slurs against autistic people, that they don't have empathy. Um, we can mentalise and sometimes we can even do that better than most because we generally do it in conscious thought. ADHDers don't forget everything. Um, they are not generally conduct disordered. Um, so all of these kind of myths that are applied, they're not the bad boys. Um, theory of mind, as I've said it numerous times, does not belong to neurotypicals. Um, but what might be useful as an approach is playfulness, acceptance, curiosity, compassion and empathy, which we've taken from um, DDP um, or Dialectical uh, Developmental Psychotherapy um, as a useful approach to think about how you might engage with neurodivergent children. Um, curiosity, compassion is the most important, I think, part of that and empathy. Um, but the empathy can only come after the curiosity and compassion. Um, to avoid double empathy problems, um, see Damien Milton for um, more on that. Um, and using a mentalising approach, what's it like? What might it be like to be an ADHD kid? What might it be like to be an autistic kid? Um, what might your existence be like? What might be difficult? So spending time, even as a team, working on that can be very helpful. We need better research as well. Um, so we need to understand phenomenology better. We need to understand neurodivergent people better. Um, and I don't think that we're there yet um, by any matter of means. In fact, that's a relatively new field of research. Um, we need to understand what neurodivergent people want from services and kudos to Simon for having undertaken that project because that's the most useful way that we can work out how we develop our services to be more inclusive. Um, 
and understanding what works um, to promote and maintain healthy neurodivergence. The problem we have is that while we still think about autism spectrum disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, and particularly when we think about them in separate categories as if they are not different sides of the same coin, um, I don't think that will happen. So that's the end in a very autistic way. Um, my favourite um, Big Bang line, diamonds don't shine Rihanna, they refract light. <laughs>